This month on Anime Cons TV, Patrick Dewey reports from a non-anime convention, which is still awesome, BlizzCon out in Anaheim, California. Sketch and Doug talk about the pros and cons of VIP badges. We talk with Charles Dunbar, who's an awesome Doctor Who cosplayer and anime anthropologist, and we give away a phone. Last month, I went to BlizzCon in Anaheim, California. BlizzCon is a video game convention that focuses on the games of Blizzard Entertainment, StarCraft, Diablo 3, and World of Warcraft, including the newly announced expansion Mists of Pandaria. At the convention, people got to try out the games, including the a uh, sample of the new Mists of Pandaria expansion for World of Warcraft. There was also a retro arcade where you could try out Diablo or other classic games, a lore stage where they had game shows, uh, there was an art gallery where you could see art from the games, and there was an artist stage where you could actually watch the artist at work. There was an autograph area where you could get autographs from developers and artists, and you could also leave your own autograph on the wall. You could bid on rare items in a charity auction, or attend a Realm meetup and see other people on your server. There were also tournaments bringing in the best players of the Blizzard games from around the world. I also get to watch a live recording of the Instance podcast in the AIE Guild Hall. I, I'll say, I won't this say this real quick. There is actually mop. So we're going to be saying mop? wow mop. Awesome. Which sounds like an I awesome was thinking about that today. Yeah. I was thinking about it today. Like, like, well, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to be there like, thinking this expansion is so exorbitant. Uh, like, and, you know, just, oh, I spilled my beer. No, don't worry. I'll get the wow mop. <laughs> And of course, there were plenty of amazing costumes at BlizzCon. This fully illuminated dragon outside after the concert just blew everybody away. Speaking of the concert, level 90 Elite Torin Chieftain returned. BlizzCon ended with a live Foo Fighters concert. Blizzard Entertainment puts a lot of effort into BlizzCon and it's quite apparent it's an amazing convention. Not just the Foo Fighters concert, but all of the other content combined. It's no wonder that it sells out in seconds every year. So if you're a fan of the Blizzard Entertainment video games, definitely try to make it out to BlizzCon next year. It's amazing.
One of the things we've been hearing a lot more about from anime conventions has been some of them have started using VIP passes and you know special badges that give certain perks and privileges to those who want to buy them. And we're kind of mixed on the issues, but so we're just going to go down and talk about some of the pluses and some of the minuses to it. So, what do you think about them? Well, they have positive things to them. I mean, you get granted line skips and early missions to uh, the popular events and uh, stuff like that. That's pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, the downside there is sometimes it's more badge types lore. I mean, uh, definitely convention staff need to be well informed of, okay, if you have this badge, you're granted these privileges and everything. And sometimes that gets really confusing. Even as when we've done press at conventions, sometimes there's been like, oh, do press get special seating for this event or not? And nobody's sure. So it's very important that if you're going to do that, you have to educate the staff and make sure they know. But I can see the appeal of it for con because it does give them more income which helps them run their event better it's mm -hmm. one of the double-edged swords is that more money helps you do more things obviously so it's a good thing is that they can you know get more income for the um con for the and especially with if a con has a an attendance cap it's it's a financial thing that could happen mm -hmm. But at the same time, not all cons need them. You know, some of the sm I'd say definitely if you're a smaller convention, probably everyone's going to be able to get into most events, and there's not going to be a huge line. So you know, you don't need that much income. I mean, it's nice to have a little extra money, but if there's not a usability for it, it's not going to help raise it. I mean, you got to make sure people are getting their money's worth. So. The other thing too is uh, with a badge. I mean, I have every single badge. I've gone to every single uh, that have, uh, for every con I've been to. I, I keep the badge. It's like a little you know timeline. Um, but what's a good thing is that usually those badges are unique, and it can be a collector's item for you um, because it's you know it's very special and unique. You, you know, only a few of you will have it. Yeah, I mean that that's definitely one thing to to look towards is if you're going to do those VIP badges is you can't make it accessible to everyone. I mean that sometimes that people say, "Oh, you're playing favorites to those who have more money," but at the same time people are paying for those perks, but you can't make it that everyone gets it because then it's like, "Well, what if 500 people with VIP badges wanted to get line skips for a 500 per seating uh room?" Well, then it kind of negates the points. So um, but a lot of times with VIP badges, they give you perks and a lot of things is discounts and other things. You spend a lot of money for the badge, but you sometimes you're offered stuff for like local businesses and or even, you know, if you think about how much money you're spending for the badge, some VIP badges are buy 10 years or have a lifetime membership. Yep, it's a lot of money up front, but if the con is big and successful enough, then, you know, it, in the long run, you save on the registration alone. Yeah, so I, I mean, once again, definitely the key point to remember with VIP badges, I, if you're going a convention planner, is you have to look at the perks and say, is this going to be worth it? Because if you get that income and then don't make it worth people's while, they're not going to buy it in the future, and that does hurt the convention because you won't have that guaranteed future income. So uh, it's a mixed bag. It yeah. is a mixed bag, and honestly, we want to hear from you. What do you think? Yeah. Tell us on our forums, Twitter, Facebook, or leave us a voicemail at 762-ADEQUATE. So we're here with Charles Dunbar, the anime anthropologist who's been to quite a few conventions and is doing a lot of research into kind of the history and the culture of anime convention fandom. Mm -hmm. So first off, I guess the good question is, what was your first convention? Anime or sci-fi? Uh, either or. Well, sci-fi, I've been going to Icon on Long Island since 1998, mm -hmm. and uh, that was my first experience in convention going, but I used to day trip it, so mm -hmm. it wasn't really the same thing that you get with other conventions. For anime conventions, it was Anime Expo New York in 2002 that my friends sort of dragged me to because they said, you got to see what a real anime con is like, you got to see what a real anime con is like, and I went to that, and then it was Bath, <laughs> <laughs> and it all kind of went from there. Yeah. Um, 
do you have anything that you particularly like seeing at a lot of conventions, like something that one con does that you wish more of them would do, or something like that? Oh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I mean, there are always the predictable answers, like programming, panels, masquerade. Mm -hmm. For me, every con is different, and I don't think every con should be the same. I mean, yeah, there are certain cons that really could, could, could have slightly better programming. There are some cons that could have slightly better events, and there are some cons that should do away with the rave altogether. Mm -hmm. But by and large, every con has its own little thing, so I don't really think that you can judge one con based on another, because it just isn't fair at that point. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you say you started going to sci-fi conventions first, and then when it, is there one key element that you think separates the two, or do you think there's... Uh, there are more similarities? Well, fundamentally I'd like to think there are more similarities between sci-fi conventions and anime conventions. I mean, when I started, I don't believe there were anime conventions in my area. The, con the convention in my area was Icon, and there was an anime track there, and the anime kids were kind of all off in the corner, and you didn't see them. And then as I went more and more, it sort of get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then the last time I went, which was last year, I, I, didn't, I couldn't go this year, I went last year, and the majority of what I saw were anime fans, and the old sci-fi fans were almost nowhere to be seen, and I'd like to think that the communities, the, the idea of community and participation is something that both sides have in common. I just, I don't, I don't have enough experience with science fiction conventions to be able to break them down or look at the populations that go there. I would like to think in a perfect world that two conventions shouldn't be any different. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, look at the presence of science fiction fandom at what were traditionally anime conventions. It's, I guess in my mind, similar to how anime took over science fiction conventions. Now you're sort of seeing the reverse happening. and. I'd like to think that maybe in a few years there will just be conventions. Mm -hmm. I know it won't. I know that won't be the case, but I'd like to think that there'll just be conventions. Yeah, you, you mentioned Porcon, and that's one convention that Multi had started off as anime and has become kind of geek culture in general. And it seems to have been working pretty well to it too. This weekend, yeah. I mean, I get the same vibe off of Porcon that I get off of Kineticon, and Kineticon openly says it's a multi-fandom convention. Kineticon, one of the things I love about it is they're dedicated to community. I mean, they have music panels for music fans. They have a great heavy metal panel there every year. They have their Battle on Five open forum discussion. The first time I went, there was a Gargoyles panel. Uh, and then there's there's all the, they have a big steampunk presence there. That's like a convention, at least in terms of mission statement and execution, that's a convention that I think manages to blend everything together rather flawlessly because you will see crowds of cosplayers of all different kinds of things. I mean, I bumped into a guy there two years ago dressed up as Billy Mays, <laughs> and he was just going around hawking at him, hawking whatever you gave him. If you gave him an anime DVD, he tried to sell it. If you gave him a plunger, he tried to sell it. And I thought that was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. And here was just a guy who just dressed up as Billy Mays because he wanted to have some fun. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was pretty cool, and I like the vibe that I get from that. I like the vibe that I got here. I mean, I, I was dressed up as the doctor all weekend, and I was getting stopped every 10 feet for pictures. And then there was the Doctor Who panel yesterday with, with Chris Ayers and J. Michael Tatum that was packed to the hills with all sorts of people who just wanted to sit and talk and converse about that. And I kind of like that vibe. I like that idea that a lot of these people can be fans of many things at once, and just they don't seem to have a problem with it. So where can people find more information about what you're up to? What I'm up to? Well, uh, you go to my website, uh, studyofanime.com. I have a list of where I'm going to be next. And I have on there just my ruminations and my little essays and my random thoughts. And um, it's just, I want to do, I'm, I'm actually thinking of doing something tomorrow on the long train ride back to New York about um, community and anime conventions, at least just from what I've seen. And I've got that. I've got my work with uh, Japanese culture. So it's all sitting around on there if you're willing to click through a long backlog of archives. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Once again, that's studyofanime.com. Mm -hmm. And be sure to check out what Charles is up to on his website. And that's also my Twitter, at studyofanime. And if you happen to see, see him at a convention and want to tell us a story, be sure to log on to animecons.com and tell us a story. <laughs>
Thanks everybody who entered our contest for the free phone. And our winner is Bill Meeks who submitted a pretty awesome video with a bunch of clips and a really cool song that goes with it. I really like it. So thank you for entering and here's the awesome ad. It goes here. Now it's voicemails! Well, let's hear the voicemail. And now for a very special announcement. Congratulations to the cast and crew of AnimeCon TV. <laughs> Thank you. You won the award for being the most watched podcast on my PC. Yes. We're number one a somewhere. Congratulations goes out to the table in the middle of the screen. Table. You've been elected the best table in the entire podcast. And I suppose the rest of you aren't too bad either. Well, thanks for all the fun. I look forward to watching your podcast next month. Cool. Thanks Good job, table. Guy. Thank you, Ikea, for this table. <laughs> Sorry, old table. You don't cut it anymore. No. Old table. Well, if you have a voicemail... You can send it to 762-ADEQUATE. That's 762-233-7828. And you can go to our Facebook page, our Twitter page, our forums, and chat us up there. We love to hear from you. We love to discuss conventions, anime, Use our anything. bandwidth. Yes. Do it. And uh, next month on the show, we'll be doing our annual year interview wrap-up, where we talk about all the things we did in 2011.